During the Second World War, there were multiple people that deserted from the Allied countries to the Axis powers. Actually, there were too many to name them all. Some of them ended up working propaganda jobs, and the American Germans that traveled to Germany to defend the Reich was of course immortalized by the fictional scene in Band of Brothers. But all these people generally deserted before there was a full-fledged war between the United States and Germany, let alone when it became obvious that Germany was going to lose the war. Well, not Martin James Monty. This United States pilot stationed in Karachi, India, deserted several weeks before his 23rd birthday. Playing a bit of bluff, he ended up in German-held territory in Europe, joined the SS propaganda unit, and even fought on the German side. But what makes this case perhaps even more strange is that all this happened in late October 1944, when it was evident to nearly everyone that Germany would lose the war. Nevertheless, the story of Martin James Monty is a very curious one, and certainly one worth telling. Martin James Monti was born in St. Louis in 1921. He was one of seven children of a Swiss Italian father and German mother that migrated to the United States. The family was staunchly Catholic, and during his teens, Monti became a firm anti communist believer. One of the reasons, if not the reason, for him developing anti communist beliefs was the radio priest, Father Charles Coughlin. Charles Coughlin became known as the radio priest, and he reached about 30 million listeners every week during his broadcasts. He raged against the U.S. bankers, and although initially supportive of President Roosevelt, over time he felt he didn't take the bankers on enough. His broadcast became a mixture of anti-communist, anti-Semitic and fascist propaganda. Coughlin supported several developments in Italy, Germany and Japan during the 30s. His radio broadcast became fanatic to the degree that in 1936 U.S. Catholics tried to silence him, among whom Joseph Kennedy with the help of the Vatican Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli, the future Pope Pius XII. These Catholics weren't necessarily known for their leftist convictions, which really says something about the content of Coughlin's broadcasts. Either way, it seemed that Coughlin managed to radicalize young Monty. Following the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, the United States officially entered the Second World War, and in 1942, at the age of 21, Monty too registered for the draft. Before he was sent off to war, he traveled to Detroit that same year to meet with Father Coughlin. Nobody knows what happened during that meeting, but what is known is that following it, Monty tried to enlist in the Navy. Now, that could have just been because his four brothers served honorably in it. Eventually, in November that year, Monty enlisted in the U.S. Air Force as an aviation cadet. Throughout 1943, he received his training as a pilot, and it was only in March 44 that he was commissioned as a flight officer. The aircraft he was allowed to fly was the P-39 Air Cobra and the P-38 Lightning, and he was promoted to the rank of second lieutenant. The fresh second lieutenant was sent to India to await further orders and placement in a combat squadron. But Monty had other plans. While Monty waited in Karachi, it was there he pulled his stunt. A week after his arrival, Monty dressed up in his uniform and managed to talk himself onto a C-46 transport aircraft flight that was bound for Cairo, Egypt. Once he arrived there, he convinced another pilot that he had to go to Tripoli. And once there, he got on an Allied aircraft that was bound for Naples. In the aftermath of this weird several day long endeavor, it took eight days in total, it may seem like a weird thing that he was allowed to get on all those planes, but after all he was a commissioned flight officer, a second lieutenant, and there wasn't much reason to doubt his intentions, let alone think that he was about to desert to the Axis powers, because, well, they were losing hard. By this point in 1944, the Second World War only lasted a little over six more months, with an Axis defeat imminent. So there was no logic in desertion by this point, and certainly nobody would expect anyone in their right mind to do so. Right. So once Monty arrived in Italy, he made his way to the Allied airbase east of Naples. He tried to join a combat squadron, but because he had no adequate paperwork, he could not be placed anywhere. Following his rejection, he traveled to another airbase, where he pretended to be part of the 82nd fighter group, the ones that had just rejected him, and managed to be allowed to perform a test flight in a PF-5E Lightning aircraft, the photographic reconnaissance version of the P-38 Lightning. Monty took off, flew for two hours, and landed safely again. But not at the airbase. No, he landed at an airstrip near Milan, a city that was still occupied by the Germans. 
Milan would not be liberated until April next year, and as such, Monti was taken into custody by the German soldiers that had a firm defensive base around the city. When he was arrested, Monti tried to convince the Germans that he wanted to be part of the Third Reich. Nevertheless, the Germans were skeptical, and who could blame them? They were losing, and suddenly an American, supposedly, voluntarily wanted to join the losing side? So Monti was deemed an ordinary prisoner of war, and sent to Luftstalag, a prisoner of war camp for Allied airmen. But within several weeks, the Germans realized Monti actually wanted to join their side. The fact an arrest was sent out by the US Air Force on the day of Monti's desertion probably helped convince them. As such, Monti was assigned a propaganda role in the Nazi German Reich. He resided in Berlin, wrote pamphlets for Allied soldiers, and made radio broadcasts. Monty worked together with Mildred Gillars, named Axis Sally by the Allied powers. She was another defector that had been broadcasting propaganda to Allied soldiers for a long time. Yet she could not stand Monty, and even threatened to quit her broadcast if he wasn't pulled off the air. And he was. The Germans reassigned Monty to creating propaganda writings and pamphlets meant for American prisoners of war. Now Monty took the nom de guerre Captain Martin Weithaupt after his mother's maiden name. So... Why did Monty decide to desert? Well, according to him, uh, the war was a global communist plot to enslave everyone. In his propaganda pamphlets, it became evident he thought the United States should have allied with Nazi Germany against the Soviet Union. During his stay in Berlin, he joined the Waffen-SS as Untersturmführer and was assigned to the SS Standarte, Kurt Eggers. The unit was named after Kurt Eggers, a German writer, poet and playwright that was part of the propaganda company and died on the Eastern Front during the war. The subsequently established unit was named after him, and it was a propaganda formation of the SS. It tracked the Waffen-SS units and publicized their actions on the Eastern Front in German. But the unit was also a deadly one. If need be, they were able to fight and wage war just as well as any other SS unit. And as the war prospects rapidly deteriorated even further for the Germans, by early 1945, Monty's SS units, including Monty, were sent to the front. All that is known is that they fought in northern Italy until the 10th of May, after Germany's unconditional surrender. And following it, Monty surrendered to the US forces in Italy, still wearing his SS uniform. Initially, he said he had been given the uniform by Italian partisans that helped him escape capture, and the US officers on his case actually believed him. As such, instead of being sentenced for desertion, he was convicted of misappropriating government property, namely the plane he stole, and for being absent without leave. About the plane, he claimed he wanted to fight the Germans, but his aircraft was shot down. As such, he was sentenced to 15 years in prison, still a pretty hefty punishment, but not nearly as bad as the punishment for desertion. Nearly a year later, in February 1946, his sentence was commuted to time served in the US Army. So yeah... Monty, the deserter, re-enlisted in the US Air Force as a private. So it seems that initially Monty got away with his antics. It wasn't until a year later an army criminal investigation officer tipped off the media about Monty's case. The Washington Post broke the story of Monty supposedly deserting, and it led to the army redirecting much more manpower to an initially innocuous case. Thanks to a more thorough investigation, authorities linked Monty to the propaganda broadcasts made by Martin Wiethaupt. And as such, in January 1948, Monty was re-arrested by the FBI. And although he worked his way up to sergeant again, he was discharged. After his arrest, a thorough psychological evaluation was conducted. Monty turned out to be highly intelligent with an IQ over 130, but he had several personality traits such as paranoid tendencies and obsessive compulsivity. These were deemed potential explanations for his erratic action. Then again, he certainly wasn't rational in deserting from the US Army when it was sure the Axis powers had lost the war. Either way, he was sentenced to 25 years in jail for treason in January 49. He ended up having to pay a $10,000 fine as well, and was released on parole only in 1968. For another 32 years, he lived in obscurity and he passed away in 2000 at the age of 78. Thank you for watching this video. If there's a topic or event you'd like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also like to thank all my patrons for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and want to support my work, consider checking me on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you will gain access to the exclusive Patreon series. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.